Hello and welcome back to the podcast. In this episode, we're going to be breaking down the resume and Excel portfolio that has led to a third round interview for a job that's entry level that's going to pay around sixty-five to seventy thousand. So, what I wanted to do in this episode is just debunk some myths or maybe some anxiety that you may be having, especially if you're trying to get your foot in the door and land an entry level analytics job. What I keep seeing over and over and over again is that students are way overthinking the hard skills. So you don't need to be an astrophysicist to get an entry level analytics job. You don't have to have an amazing technology stack and know all the tools and all the coding languages. In this episode, you're going to see a relatively simple Excel portfolio that, by the way, Rachel said that the interviewers were actually really, really impressed with. So you don't need a ton of technical experience to get your foot in the door. And then in the second half of the episode, we're going to break down the resume that led to the actual first interview. So by the way, this is a one-click apply that Rachel found through LinkedIn, so it took her 30 seconds to apply for this job. This podcast is segments from one of our career services lectures where we talked about resumes and also where Rachel did a portfolio review and showed our other students the work that she'd done that actually led to her getting that third round interview. I hope you enjoy the episode. I basically just used the data set from, I believe it's going to be introduced in the Power BI module, actually. Um, it's an enterprise resource planning data set, so it mainly deals with inventory um, concerns. So average inventory on hand in terms of dollar amount and then in stock percentages, uh, which is basically your customer walks in the store. You want to have product on the shelf. So what percentage of the time? Um, were you able to meet their needs right there? Um, and what percentage of the time were you not able to? Um, ideally, that does not fall below 95%, but doesn't really climb above 98, 99%, because in either of those scenarios, um, you kind of, you're wasting money. So, um, and that's actually, the in-stock percentage is actually the factor that I chose to really drill down on, is uh, that sort of threshold when I built out the small dashboard for this and when I did um, more of the modeling that you'll see in a bit. So everything in the data set is broken down, you know, by item number, ID, num um, ID number, you've got fiscal years 2017 through 2019, and then that's further broken down by week. Uh, and that's where the actual data set um, the original data set ends. I went in and actually just did a calculated field using an if-then formula to basically have Excel say, okay, if the in-stock percentage is below 95%, put yes. If not, put no. Um, and then I just used a count if formula for the below threshold percentage to see what percentage of the time uh, throughout this whole data set of this whole period of reporting, uh, were we basically below that 95% threshold um, and did not kind of meet our minimum in stock percentage expectations? And that was 21% of the time. So I went from there and basically copied over what I had here and then did some forecasting formulas. So I took the data from 2017 and then I wanted to forecast for 2018. Um, I used the simplest forecast formula. Um, if I had more factors, kind of like the in-stock percentage that directly impacted the sales, 
um, or if I, you know, spent more time studying the seasonality of the sales as well, then I might could have done something more complex with the forecast formula. But as it stands, I just did the simplest formula, um, which references basically it wants to reference an X factor, like the in-stock percentage that directly impacts your sales. And then it wants to reference all your sales numbers um, as well as all of your predicted in-stock percentages. And then it will give you a sales forecast, which is what I did. And as you can see, um, Excel's formula is really optimistic uh, because there there is a bit of seasonality affecting that. And also um, just in general, uh, sales trended down over the year of 2018, the data set. So I actually built like a little, actually had Excel build a little forecast sheet. Like if you go to data and you're in the forecast sheet and that was a little bit more accurate um, in terms of the trend line um, I just had it do a linear line with an, I think the, um, the confidence, um, never was like 95%. So, uh, that ended up being a little bit more accurate than my formula, but I did show that as well, just, uh, you know, for more proof of concept for visualization of the forecasting. And then this was the dashboard I built, um, I'm a very visual person, so I'll go ahead and apologize a little bit for the lack of slicers apart from this one that are kind of more visually accessible, uh, that make it more interactive. But uh, for the chart that didn't have a slicer attached, it you can still drill down by year um, and also by item number ID. You could just drill down through that and it will change. Um, though when you look, the way I kind of validated my visualizations was by kind of comparing them side to side to each other. So I noticed, you know, for the same set of parameters, like, am, like the same dimensions are my measures trending the same direction. And they are for both in stock percentage, inventory on hand and dollar amount and sales and dollar amount. They're all trending the same direction. Um, you see kind of the same dip and then raise back up. So that kind of, to me, was a second validation that, yes, uh, this model was built correctly. And then I just have a few KPI cards here up at the top uh, that kind of advertise the average in stock percentage for all three years of data. Same thing for the uh, percentage of time we were below the 95% threshold for the in stock percentage and the average overall monthly sales across all three years. Um, because those were kind of just the key KPIs in, you know, that were relevant to the topics I chose to drill down on. Very cool. So can you drill down on one of the assortment IDs? Yeah. Okay, very cool. Yep, and it will, it will of course, change and do that. Though you do kind of see, for the most part, the same seasonal trends that correspond with the level of in-stock percentage. All right, awesome. So good job. That was that was amazing, Rachel. Uh, any feedback? Any any uh, comments, questions, concerns from the other students? This is amazing, Rachel. This is so professional. You know, yeah, here, pull pull back up. You, you have oh. your internet. yeah. So we can take a look at it and just have a conversation around it. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think you did do a really good job of explaining the use case and then you showcase that, you know, some advanced um, formulas and you can also create an interactive dashboard on Excel. Um, so I guess this is where we can kind of get a little bit more nuanced. So Rachel, th is this, an, this is an entry level job, right? Or an associate level? I believe so. Okay. I want to say it is. So, uh, for an entry level job, this is top notch work. And they said that, right? They said this was really fancy. This is really like yeah. amazing. So it, you knocked it out of the park. To get a little bit more nuance of like if you're going to be applying for mid to either senior level, um, what you may want to do is start out with a findings page of walk through the case study, outline the business problem, and then say, here are the key findings. So that that's something 
And this is this is a use case that you just like kind of came up with. So what we could have done is like gone through the, the use case and identified one specific area where, you know, maybe that 21% where it was below the threshold of 95% in stock, maybe it, that was happening with two of the assortments. So we could have said, all right, we're going to role play that this is, I'm talking to the supply chain manager and we've identified two very specific assortments where you need to come in and intervene. So mm -hmm. that's where you can kind of take it up to the next level. But I think you've done a really good job of, well, number one, they didn't source this case study because, and I think this is really interesting because they just said, hey, walk us through a case study. So they just left it completely open-ended, which might be a good thing for some. And for other people, it's kind of existentially dreadful of, well, there's no parameters on this. There's no like, because Rachel, they didn't even say like, here are the formulas we use. We want to know that you, because they said in a cell assessment, they didn't yeah. say um, like, and you took that initially as it was just going to be like a like a questionnaire or like, yeah, like a, a test. Like they're going to give me a data set and like watch me. Right. But I think you've done a really good job of, of showing that you understand kind of the business game that's being played. Um, yeah. Finding out that high level um, KPI of 21% is below the threshold. That's a really key insight. So really, really good job there. That's awesome. Yeah. So no other comments, questions, or concerns? So have you guys done any of this stuff in Excel? Chris, I know that you've done some like more advanced functions, right? Yeah, I've done a few more related to like cash flows and, you know, a lot of count if statements and stuff like that, um, you know, and nested statements, but nothing, you know, a couple graphs and things, but not as in depth or as, you know, more like uh i mean this is very beautiful to look at like my stuff is more just back end for me to you know work with my data <laughs> right gotcha yeah yeah well, you say that because the count if formula was just what i used to calculate the below threshold because I, I i was being admittedly a little a little lazy i didn't want to use math so um for the calculated fields where i had it uh determine yes or no are we below threshold um i just took that and did the count if and that was such that was such a good shortcut. No, I mean that's fantastic though. Like what what you did is you took the data set, you added onto it, and then added a very interesting insight to it. To where it's funny because Rachel, we were talking about it, this would be so much easier to do in Tableau or Power BI. Yeah, you know, like we, we could quickly visualize this. To where when you started building out the dashboard, I was like, I don't know how to make the slicer apply to everything, just because I I don't visualize data in. It. Excel because it's there there are new tools that have come and kind of replaced it. Yeah. So yeah, I think you've done a, a really good job of you're probably visualizing it more effectively than a lot of the people on the team. Yeah, I know how I know what I could do to improve it, um, which I didn't, you know, really wax poetic on that in the interview at all. But I know um I know we had discussed, you know, how do we make the slicers work for everything? How do we make this more interactive? And if my computer could have handled it, um, just doing a VLOOKUP table would have solved mm. the problem, but my my computer refuses. Yeah, that, well, that's another limitation too, is that, yeah, it just, and because I think Old if, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, I think Excel can handle roughly 60,000 rows of data or something like that. And then it starts to like really just, you know, short out and not not be effective. But that's if you have a computer that's got, you know, a lot of RAM and can really process things. Mm. So yeah, that's so, that's that's fair. Bentley, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just I'm curious. Yeah, this is, this looks awesome. Um, what kind of experience did you have prior to this? With one of the things I'm curious about is like the forecasting formulas. I know how to do a lot of the stuff that you did here, but I don't know anything about forecasting formulas and how that works. So I'm curious. Like, did you have experience with that before this? Did you have experience with setting up these graphs and charts the way that you did, or did you have to learn a lot as you were going along? Um, so that's a that's an interesting question. Um. So oddly enough, I didn't actually learn the forecasting bit um, and some of the more visual like graphing aspects of Excel um, anytime recently. It was actually years ago in a biophysics class in college because the professor kind of went off the rails, didn't teach us from the textbook. And he said, OK, we're going to learn more about data modeling because I'm taking a data modeling approach to 
biophysics, like the movements of cells through the body and um, how can we predict the flow rate of ions through sodium channels and bloodstream and things like that. So that's actually where I learned all my forecasting. And I remember talking to John David, I was like, I know I've got notes on this. They're from college. I'll find them buried somewhere on my computer and then I'll, then I'll finish out the forecasting bit, um, which is what I did. So that's actually where I learned how to do that was just a totally different use case years ago. Okay. And of course, Excel got, you know, several updates since then, because it's been the better part of a decade. But yeah, it was a weird place to learn it, but effective. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's great. This is awesome. So Bentley, another thing that you may want to look into is um, in Tableau, they have a forecasting capability. Okay. And right now, Rachel, your forecast is just kind of throwing bands out of like where this might go mm -hmm. to where you can actually model um, seasonality within within it. So it'll like so it's basically the line is going up and down and then it's just three lines out. Um, yeah. You can start to, to model that in. I don't remember the specific name of it, but there's a ton of videos on YouTube breaking down how to do that. Yeah. OK. okay. Yeah, I'd love to think of a, a forecasting project to do. Um, yeah. Well, I mean. Or this is the the point of a, of me throwing these real data sets at you. Yeah. You can take any of these cases, any of the six that I've given you in this class and just go and repurpose them. In sure. Whatever way. And because I mean, especially with the supply chain data, it's like you've got geographical data, you've got item level detail and you've got time series data. So there's so many different ways you could slice through that data. Uh -huh. and, and it's a, it's a really robust data set too. And so, I think, doesn't Tableau have, um, they're like kind of generic free data set. They call it like Superstore or something. Has like a lot to work with in there. That's true. Okay. Oh, let me write that down. Yeah, I think Excel itself just has, they have like five different forecasting formulas you can use. And I just use the most basic one because, I mean, frankly, it was late at night. I didn't want to be bothered. <laughs> where, where does it, where do you find that in Excel? I'm curious. Like where? Um, so I just typed in, um, like enter and then uh, forecast like that. Oh, wow. okay. uh -huh. and it will actually give you um, all I guess all six and they will allow you to um, oh, that's cool there's one with seasonality, in it. seasonality. Yeah. Um, and if you you can do sort of um, just a linear trend uh -huh. um, and then if you actually do this one uh-huh um, the forecast.ets it will give you the option to input uh factors to account for things like seasonality and other factors that might affect it but oh cool i, I yeah i didn't do it for this data set and i think if you, you type in function it will no it won't <laughs> It used to. It used to. Yeah, I think you could used to type in like uh, equals function. And it would pull up like a formula table. But interesting. So what it's doing there is it's you put in the function and you drag the, the drag it down. So it's just doing it week by week compared to last year's. Yep. Um, okay. My yeah, my function formula. Uh, it just wants you to reference uh, basically um, a known x value and x value in the future and a y value um hmm, okay and a known y value and the known x value is going to be kind of the big impact on sales which for me was the in-stock percentage so that was my i just referenced the in-stock percentages for 2018 um sorry for 2017 i lied um and then i uh, was able to reference the ones for like the known Ys, the sales data, and then I was able to reference the known Xs for going forward in the future. What do I know our in-stock percentages are going to be? And then it predicted sales based on that. Got it. Okay. Sweet. Awesome. Okay. So I only use Excel for like VLOOKUPs and pivot charts. If anything beyond that, I start to go into more powerful tools like Power BI or Tableau. Um, but uh, this is a cool example of you guys getting to see someone actually building out um, functions that I, you know, like Bentley, I would much rather use the forecasting functionality in Tableau than in Excel. Um, yeah. But I think it's, well, also too, so Rachel, let's pivot the conversation around 
um, just the overall interview process. So this this was a case study that you put together for, what's the specific title? Is it Compensation Analyst? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then are you comfortable talking about the, the pay range at all? Because it's yeah. associate level. So, and then you threw out a specific number. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, their range for the level um, over the various conversations I had had the initial number or range they gave me was 60 to 65,000. Um, if and when an offer does come, I'm going to see if I can negotiate uh, closer to 70. Yeah, I, th I think that's I, that's reasonable, especially because you're, you're going to be a, a hybrid position in Greensboro, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. right. Also, after learning about the workload, um, it's definitely going to be a pretty intense workload uh, that they've said, which is why they're trying to divide it among two people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, the average the average household income I think is fifty four thousand dollars in Greensboro, North Carolina. So that's I mean that's entry level, and it's already twenty thousand dollars above you know the average income. Um, so I think Rachel, that would be a fantastic starting point for your first role or your first job in the space start absorbing all of that. It's also with a pretty solid company too. So it's a name brand company, uh, especially if you're on the East Coast. So that could be your foot in the door and then you start building building from there. Um, does anybody have any questions about the overall interview process for Rachel? Rachel, do you just want to break down? So this is your this was your third interview. They've already said, hey, we love the work that you did. We're going to schedule an in-person fourth interview, right? Mm -hmm. So the what were the the three previous interviews? So three previous was a screening call that was supposed to be 15 minutes kind of turned into closer to like 45 minutes uh, just because um, me and the girl really hit it off. Uh, second one was with the director of total pay and compensation, which was uh, her name is Paula. And that was more of the behavioral interview mm -hmm. and then this past one was more of a technical interview that was really suited to their needs because they do the majority of their work in excel and while they do use power bi tools they are proprietary to them so it's okay. not something they could really test me on but they did say if you've used microsoft power bi you'll pick this up very easily so very cool well congratulations that's that's huge that uh because i mean you're what you joined the program five weeks ago? Yeah. Yeah. So and then, time. here, I'll pull up Rachel's resume. So, I mean, isn't that surprisingly sparse? The, most of the resumes I look at are just jam-packed with information. But oh, I don't know. I hope that's not offensive, Rachel. It's not sparse. It's just, it's sparse compared to the people who just want two or three pages. So, Chris, mm -hmm. let's circle back to your question. Can you fit it all in one page? So if you're in, if you're going for an associate level job, you want it within one page. Yeah, I can get it. It's all on one page, but it's like you know, every every stinking line, you know. <laughs> but uh, that that's fine. And then there also might be opportunities where you can shave off some of the details, you know, and just and just pick and choose, you know, what's what's relevant versus what's not. All right. Bentley, I can see you leaning in real, real hard. What's your take? What you have any questions, comments, concerns about Rachel's? I don't. I, I'm I sent just you this resume it. template. Yeah, yeah. I know. I've already started working on my resume. I've, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you have just, any questions for of, Rachel? Uh, not, not currently. I'm kind of just taking things in here and processing. Um, yeah, it was hard for me to sort of turn my experience and give it like that sort of analytics advantage sort of spin on it because, and like my degree is like totally out there. It's like forensics. It has absolutely nothing to do with that. So I actually integrated that through my portfolio and that's been a huge talking point in interviews so far and just with people in general. Yeah, and that kind of relates, Rachel, on that little, that tangent there, that relates back to Drew connected with the, I don't know, executive vice president executive vice president of blue cross and blue shield because he made a post about philosophy and data analytics so if you have like these obscure interests 
you can definitely work them into the conversation and the fact that you're passionate about it, I think makes the interview a lot better. So instead of just being like really bland and boring and, you know, just tight knit, it's you're loosening up, you're showing a little bit of who you are. Cause at the end of the day, I mean, you're going to have to spend potentially if it's a full-time in-person job, 40 hours a week with these people. So they need to like, know that you're somebody that is actually enjoyable to be, to be around. <laughs> Can you zoom in a little bit on it? Sure. I was about to say, I zoomed out so that we could see more. Is that better? Yeah, that's way better. So Rachel, you did a fantastic job on this this last one. Which, yeah, I mean, that's that was kind of like your first, like, grown up. Well, I guess working in the pharmacy tech. But were you in school when you were doing that? Uh, no. Okay. But that was like my first out of college job and both of those jobs were under the same boss who was like my neighbor for 20 years it okay. was very much um in the job space i'll just call it in-person networking advantage um but gotcha. yeah, he, he was he was a pharmacist was my neighbor so yeah the the cq thing was the first thing out of hometown out of that so that's where most of like my quote unquote like big wins are right now on my resume is there. Mm -hmm. So. Ben, you got any questions? You've been awful, awful quiet tonight. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> taking it all in. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think this is very similar to how my resume looks as well. Template wise. Um, I would just say that, yeah, trying to decipher what makes it to one page is right. Yeah. Because you've got a pretty robust work history. You've got a lot going on. So we've, we've got a coaching call this coming week. So we can kind of like, you want to prioritize the things that are most relevant mm -hmm. for an analytics job. Okay. And that uh, maybe a way to think about how to prioritize is where are the best stories that paint you in a good light okay. for a potential analyst job and maybe okay. prioritize those. Because um, one thing that people, I get a lot of questions about are like, well, okay, these two are seamless. They back up to each other. But what if I have like a five-year gap here before I list this out? I think that's fine. I think that like as long as you don't have a current gap, or it could even be the the the, the gap before that other job. Um, I don't think that's going to be that big of a deal. Right. Um, it is a bit. You're at a bit of a disadvantage if you don't have current work history. Um. Although that being said, you can get a little creative. So we've, we actually placed two stay-at-home moms who hadn't been in the workforce for, I think one was seven and one was 12 years. Mm -hmm. um, but we got a little creative about listing, um, you know, one was doing like freelance analytics work. So we oh, put that as her current job, um, which was a little bit of a stretch on the truth. I mean, she was helping her husband with his job. So that's, right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you can get a little, a little creative there. Um, it's a bit of an ethical gray area. Um, or you can also volunteer right. for, for, you know, different things. And that's, yeah, I, I would say that's ethically okay. Um, Cause she, it's not like she said, I work for this company. She was just listing out the, the stuff that she was doing, which was, that's actually how she found out that she was into analytics was that she started helping with some of those tasks. Right. Mm -hmm. You guys got any other questions? Um, how important do you think, you know, on this template, there's the uh, summary on mine. I don't have a summary. Mm. Basing on the fact that you are having a hard time fitting it all into one page, don't do the summary. I think that um, the summary is a little bit, it's, we, we've A-B split tested, summaries do work. Like the, the, these are leading to jobs, but um, it sounds like the trade-off for you is either you can include the summary or are there a bunch of things that you're gonna have to cut out that are relevant that might help you get. Um, Chris, have you started sending out the resume yet? Yeah. Are you getting results on it? Um, I've had a couple screening calls and then that's about it so far. Uh, how many, like how, how many um, applications have you sent out? Oh, probably in the neighborhood of like 70-ish. Okay. I mean, that's, 
that's if you've gotten three phone screenings off of off of seven applications, that's like that's okay. Um, although the kind of unknown thing is you have no idea how many of those they haven't even gotten around to, you know, you might have phone screenings coming up. Right. Um, to where one of my best students the first year at Greensboro College, it took her six weeks of applying. She probably applied for 150 jobs before she, she applied for 150 jobs in six weeks, heard nothing, then got two phone screenings and an offer the next week. So <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a numbers game. Um, are they, are these one click applications or are they going on the website? Uh, most on the website. Okay. One way that you could potentially get that number up would be to do one click applies. Because Rachel, the two leads you've gotten have been through one click applies, right? Yeah. So people just crap all over one click applies. They work. I don't know. I guess some, some people get burned on it, but it's like my, my philosophy on the one click applies is just work it into to like the habit of your week of I'm for 45 minutes in the morning, you know, but before I go to work, I'm going to sit down for 45 minutes and send out resumes. So then that, I mean, it takes you, once you get set up with one click apply, you can do them in like 20, 30 seconds. Right. So if you did 30 minutes a day, five days a week, you could easily hit a thousand applications and it wouldn't even feel like that much. Um, but that kind of gets to, there are different kinds of luck. So it's, it's hustle luck. So you're just getting out there and just, you know, putting yourself out there, putting yourself out there, putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. um, we do have um, quite a bit of recruiters that we've been working with. Um, it's interesting. I'm in early stages yet, but I may um, be partnering with a pretty, like the second largest recruiting agency in Greensboro. Um, so I'm, I may be able to get some temporary jobs um, for, because the downside of the Greensboro recruiting agency is like, how many of you guys want to move to Greensboro? <laughs> Minus Rachel. Hey. You, you, you do? Hey. All right. Well, I might, I might. I, I can't, but I want to. Unfortunately, oh, okay. my ex-husband and I share custody, so he has to want to move there too. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I, I guess. There. Yeah, Greensboro is an interesting place. It's so cheap here, though, compared to Orlando. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then Bentley, you're in Long Island. Ooh. Yeah, it's crazy out here. It's so expensive. Yeah. We actually, my wife and I are thinking of moving to North Carolina, but it's not like we weren't thinking right away. So. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm. I'd be happy to show you guys around. Greensboro is is really cheap, but there's like there's Raleigh and there's Charlotte. Mm -hmm. And it's like they're high, they're they're rapidly becoming expensive, and it's like slowly coming towards us to where yep. people are getting get living in Greensboro and then like hybrid or just commuting. Um, yeah. Although Chris, Chris, you're the one who to talk about for real estate. <laughs> 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 so, um, all right. Well, I think that's all I've got. I just wanted to cover Excel and then talk about 